26, um, an act relating to restricting retail and internet sales of electronic cigarettes, liquid nicotine, and tobacco paraphernalia. And <clears throat> two of the people um, are on um, the phone. So please don't have your uh, thing plugged in. And uh, um, Colette has, uh, she's the owner, and she'll, she's the owner of a, Hi, Colette, this is Julie Cuthbert, oh, calling from House Human Services. I'm good, thanks. I'm going to put you on the speakerphone with the committee, okay? All right, thank you. Could you hit that green button for me, please? <laughs> Colette, this is um, Representative Ann Pugh. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. No. All right. Sorry. Okay. I hope it's easier if I just do this. Colette? Colette, can you hear me? Not very well. No. Okay. Um, if I scream, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, you seem to be beeping in and out a little bit. Okay. Sorry. Um, Thank you very much. We that, can, is, that appears better. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we actually can hear you quite well. Mm -hmm. um, thank, thank you very you much. Mike. And uh, so why don't you um, introduce yourself? Um, and I see that you have some testimony that you want to read or, or talk about, and then we will ask you questions. That, that sounds great. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chair Q and members of the House Human Service Committee, Thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify in support of 826. For the record, my name is Colette Voice of Manchester, Vermont. My husband, Ed, who is also here with me, we both hope to answer any questions you have and are grateful for this occasion to present our case. My husband and I have owned the Beverage Den and Bay Shop in the heart of downtown Bennington for the past five years. As some of you know, our store has been a long-standing fixture in the community for over 40 years. We're proud to offer a wide selection of Vermont-based products from craft beers, maple syrup, to wine, to date products. We're also proud to, to employ seven full-time and two part-time Vermonters. At the time we purchased the store, it was near ready to close its doors due to the emergence of several big box stores in the Bennington area. By investing our time, effort, and money into creating a vape shop, we've been able to create a predictable revenue stream that allows us to continue operating. While the proposed 92% tax on e-cigs and base products is economically daunting, we believe 826 will serve to mitigate the negative economic consequences of this tax on Vermont businesses and will further the legislature's efforts to reduce underage consumption of tobacco substitutes. With, regarding, with regard to the conversation surrounding underage purchases, it's important to recognize the difference in regulatory safeguards a business like ours offers as opposed to an internet retailer. At our store, we have multiple levels of safeguards to ensure consumers of these big and made products are of legal age. First of all, we have a designated tobacco and vape area that requires you to demonstrate that you are 18 or older with entry gate and signage before entering our vape and tobacco area. The customer then goes in that area and encounters locked state cabinets containing products that require only our employees to unlock for customers. They are not acceptable for customers serving themselves. Finally, there's a second ID checkpoint at our counter when checking out these items. These safeguards are very effective in preventing underage persons. As you know, our store is also subject to standard compliance operations by the Department of Liquor Control, which we routinely pass. Now, for a moment, let's contrast this situation with the internet, where teens have access to countless websites offering them cheaper products with minimal of any safeguards. According to the Journal of American Medical Association, under 18 are successful in 94% of their attempts to purchase these things online. This access to the internet is an easier venue for underage Vermonters to acquire these products illegally. If the state is going to impose a tax to curb underage use, we cannot ignore the fact that they can currently be easily purchased.
purchased online. H-26 addresses these concerns. As I understand it, a large driving force in the conversation to tax leasing and vape products has been the goal to establish parity in tax rates between tobacco products and tobacco substitutes. However, considering the fact that the online purchase of cigarettes is currently illegal, passing the tax on its own will not achieve parity. Only by coupling the tax with internet restrictions contained in H-26 will the state truly be treating tobacco products and tobacco substitutes on a level playing field. It's also very important to note that the proposed tax will not decrease consumption, but will rather drive consumers to look to other states with more competitive tax rates or to the internet to purchase safe and easy products. In anticipation of this deferral of consumption, the state can more accurately ensure a decline in consumption by prohibiting the online purchase of these products. Finally, it's necessary to address the economic realities in the room. The proposed 92% tax rate will hurt our business. However, by passing H-26, you can take a real step towards supporting Vermont-based brick-and-mortar retailers by mitigating the economic consequences of this tax, all while furthering your efforts to curb underage consumption. This bill is a win-win both for Vermont retailers as well as advocates and policymakers who will be sure to experience the intended benefit. For all of these reasons, we respectfully ask you to pass H-26 out of committee with a favorable recommendation. At this time, Ed and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Colette and um, Ed, for the part that you had in writing this. And um, thank you for putting it um, in writing so that uh, we can see it and go, and go back to it. Um, committee? Do you have questions for Colette or her husband? Uh, Colette, uh, um, I'm curious. Uh, this is Mary Beth Redmond, um, a representative from Essex. I'm curious what percent of your business this e-cigarettes are and what you think the impact of it will be, this legislation. Um, are you referring to e-cigs or vapes? Because the, the industry has shifted away from e-cigs. Those are the disposable <coughs> use products that a lot of the tobacco companies were selling a few years ago. Everybody has moved now to vapes, which are refillable and <coughs> uh, over and over for a long period of time and just require you to put juice in them. So I'm going to I'm going to uh, refer to really just baby products because we sell very very few e Um Hi, this is Ed, her husband. Um, thank you, folks. Um, the the answer to that question is a little complicated in the sense that while um, if you look at our store on an overall basis, the percentage of sales that are um, you know, vape shop related or vape related are probably only against actual dollar value, maybe 20%, 25%. However, what's important uh, for us, and um, this, this isn't just for us, it's for any store in this situation that sells these different products, is the, the profit margins on all the other things we sell, beer, wine, uh, you, you know, and cigarettes, other tobacco products, <laughs> and magazines, and newspapers, and so forth. They're very, very small profit margins, especially when you have to compete against the big box stores. So the vape shop, when you sell vape products, not only do we feel like we're getting people off cigarettes and so forth, but it introduces a higher profit margin into the blend of our business, which allows us to remain sustainable. And you know that's where the 92% tax will hurt us, but at the same time, the age 26 will hope to offset that as much as possible. Um, but just for the record, that that base component of our store has been growing over the last five years. We, when we bought the store, there was no vape shop, and as Ed said, it's now about 25 percent, maybe even 30 percent of our business. So um, it has been growing as we've been able to move a lot of Vermonters. I would say both young and old. I have big customers that are 75 years old that have finally been able to get off cigarettes. Um, so we've, we've been able to uh, see success in that area and it continues to grow. Great, thank you. 
Wow, it's 26% of your business. So um, do you have any sense as to um, how much is you might gain um, by us um, limiting internet sales? Well, not really. What's, what's unknown to us today is, we, we, well, we know for a fact, we have people that will come into the store and make reference to the fact, oh, I usually buy this online, but I'm striving to buy, so, you know, I okay. decided to pop in. So we, we know there's a presence out there of some of our customers that may decide to buy online for, for whatever reason. Um, and then we know there's a population of folks that are buying online uh, that never, you know, they, they never think about going to a store like ours or any other store for that matter. Uh, and that's just a personal decision. I mean, you can use the Amazon model, I guess, in that case. So it's hard for us to measure that. We, we don't know if we're going to pick up 1% or, you know, 50%. We, we just, we honestly don't have a handle on that. We've not. We've not deployed any metrics to try to figure that out. Um, so I, I wish I had a better answer. No, that's a, that, that's a fine answer. I, you know, there's no good or bad answer. <laughs> James. <laughs> are there many in Nebraska? There are many. <laughs> so, I mean, I would say that it's more complicated than just internet sales, right? Because um, if we have the tax, you have to compete with Massachusetts and New York, right? So Correct. Yeah, and, that, and that's, that's a big problem for us. Um, you know, and that, that's, that's one of the, I mean, we, we've been scrambling over the last couple of weeks to try to figure out how to mitigate to the best of our ability this tax, because it's gonna have, it is without a doubt gonna have an impact. And we, we found ways to soften the landing, so to speak, a little bit, but, um, it, you know, our biggest fear is that the business we currently have is then going to move to the internet and you know they'll join all the you know the purchases that are currently being done by underage people on the internet so the internet is going to become the real main area of commerce in the state of vermont for vape products uh, so it's um, and then you know like anything else i, I guess we can logically imagine that um, if that were the case you know, with the younger crowd, the you know, under 18 crowd, 14, 15, 16 year olds that we hear are buying these things off the internet, I mean, the more prevalent that becomes, that'll get horizontal real quick and we'll teach each other how to do it. And you'll just see, I think you'll just see an inbound, you know, increase in intensity in those types of purchases as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there other questions for? <coughs> for Colette or Ed. Thank you. Um, thank you both for taking time out of your store to um, to testify. And um, I, I I particularly um, note your comment that this bill is a win-win situation for, um, as you said, Vermont brick and mortar re retailers, and a win for advocates and policymakers. Um, so thank you for that. And thank, sure. you, thank you for adding your voice. Yes. Well, thank, thank you for allowing us. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Thank afternoon. you. Bye-bye. Okay. We'll get the phone people out of the way. Um, um, Gaten, um, Gaetano, who's from Bellows Falls. <clears throat> Wasn't it there when Colette was speaking? <laughs> I thought there was going to be a one phone getting him we will move to um to you Patrick
going to put you on the speaker phone with the committee, okay? All right, thanks. Catano, it's Representative Van Pugh. How are you? Hi, good. How are you? Good. See, I keep my word. But where are you? Okay. You're on the phone. Okay, great. I was, um, so I'm on the Rockingham Select Board, and we were done with our budget, and town meeting is Tuesday, and we had to call an emergency meeting yesterday that I have to attend today. We had a piece of fire apparatus uh, taken out of service, and now we have to try to figure that out. That's a good excuse. Our, That's a good excuse. Our, and our so, hard work and our level funded budget, so we have a meeting at 3 o'clock I have to attend to, so I couldn't make it today, I apologize. That's that's all right, I was just teasing you and our prior witness was on the phone as well. Um, sure. But so you are, um, you want to speak about H26, which is an act relating to restricting retail and internet sales of electronic cigarettes, liquid ni um, nicotine and tobacco paraphernalia in Vermont to limit it to um, retail to wholesalers. Correct. And so you want to testify? Sure. I mean, I would oppose this this bill um, simply because first of all, I have two retail stores and I have a website. We don't ship anything on the internet since the FDA passed one of their. Um, first set of regulations in which under federal law if you sell these products on the internet you have to go through a three-part age verification process so w we're mostly retail I just simply stopped my internet because um, it's a lengthy process and I personally am not interested in and being scammed by someone who may not be of age. So under federal law, this is already, it's a law under federal law right now. So my concern is for someone who may live in the middle of Vermont, who's landlocked, who can't go to New Hampshire or a different state to purchase their products. Um, I'm sure you've all seen the news release uh, two weeks ago from the New England Journal of Medicine their study stating that these products were twice as effective as any NRT system on the market. Everyone knows what an NRT mm -hmm. system is, right? Why don't you, um, there's, some, so, there, there's some nods um, of confusion. So what is an NRT? Nicotine. It's a nicotine replacement uh, therapy, i.e. the nicotine patch, the gum, the lozenge. Mm -hmm. as, as, are people aware of the Yes. This, yep. So they're saying vaping is twice as effective as um, these products in helping an adult uh, move away from smoking cigarettes, giving, giving an adult a choice to use a much safer product. So let's say that person in the middle of Vermont who doesn't have a reliable vape shop around and has been ordering his products from a juice company that he likes their juice, he likes their e-liquid. I don't see how punishing that person is going to help with, um, what I think we should punish are the people, it's a federal law. So if someone's breaking that law right now by punishing an adult, my concern is for the customers who are of legal age who use these products. So, you know, I've been competing in essence with the internet for five years. I mean, you can buy anything on the internet cheaper, but we have folks who like to come to our retail store where they'll get great customer service and care. We show them how to use it. We show them how to use it safely. So, I mean, it's, it may seem odd that I don't support this, but I think I fight for my customers' rights. Anyone, any adult who's used this product to not smoke cigarettes, I don't think they should be punished. So restricting their ability, if they're an adult Vermonter who lives in a very rural section and has been successful in ordering these products from a company they like, I think they should be able to do that. I think we should continue to figure out what to do with the kids, you know? I think. You know, we, you have to be 18 to come in our store. This is all we sell. We don't sell 
beer. We don't sell tobacco. This is all we do. And we're very good at it and we're very respectful. We have awards um, from the Vermont Department of Liquor Control, five years running. They send in underage people. We tell them they're not old enough. They come in and shake our hands and ask for our certificates and give us a little plaque. And we have some local prevention groups who have also given us certificates that we proudly display on our wall. I don't sell the jewel. It's probably the one product you hear most about. So I'm a little off topic, but I'm not in favor of. That's um, clear. Yeah. Thank you, Gitano. Is there? We have a couple of questions for you around this bill. Sure. So two questions. I'm Mary Beth Redman from Essex. Two questions. Hey. One, why? Uh, I'm curious why you don't sell the jewel, and two. Wouldn't, inter wouldn't um, restricting internet sales drive more people to buy at your retail stores, and thus helping your business? Um, very good question, thank you. So, in all honesty, as, a, as, a, as someone who used these products to stop smoking after watching all my grandparents die, my best friend die, from throat or lung cancer, I tried to quit. I was successful with this product. I made zero nicotine. I don't drink, I don't use drugs, so this is what I enjoy to do. I'm 48 years old. When the Jewel came out, it was controversial, right out of, right off, right out of the gate. It was higher nicotine, and I saw and read, I read a lot and pay attention to a lot of things that it was getting in the wrong hands. It was, I've just been against it. I just don't support it. If an adult uses one to quit smoking, I support that. But the fact that it became trendy, or whatever the word may be, discreet, I didn't want to be associated with that. We don't, we sell, we don't sell it. I never have. If I was just doing this, like some people in Montpelier think, I'm just a businessman. I'm invested in this industry. I, I mean, I'm a success, I have a successful construction company. I'm very passionate about the adults that I've seen, that I've witnessed, that I've helped, watching them with their lives because of these products. So, on the other hand, you could walk in a T-Bird, that's what I call it, our local convenience store, and take my, she's now 19, but years ago, my 16-year-old daughter, we'd get a Gatorade after a soccer game, she would have to be exposed to these products at the counter because there they are at the counter, like in my store. So, I mean, the second part of this bill is interesting to me, too. Where they're sold, I think we should, we should work on where they're sold, not at a convenience store where it's age restriction, where it's not age restricted. So, um, to summarize, I, I don't sell it because it's controversial, and I, I'm, I'm against it. Okay. Hmm. Thank you. We have, um, I believe, one more question from... Wait, oh, no. Actually, second, same question. The second, oh, I'm sorry. The second, the second part of that question? Oh, sorry. sure. <clears throat> um, I think I kind of touched on it earlier. I, I've been competing with the Internet since I've been in business, and I understand uh, we've had customers that will go and try. You know, they can buy a product for probably half the price of what I sell it for. Some of them do that, and they may not have good luck, they don't know how to use it, it's not the right color, it doesn't work, they have no warranty. They all eventually come back. So, you know, we have a really good regular customer base that, that we work with, and I'm just, you know, I'm gonna go back to that person in the middle of Vermont who doesn't have a vape shop around who's been buying his juice from Kentucky and he likes it and it works for him. I don't think he should be penalized. Thank you. And I'm, I'm right next to New Hampshire too, so I also compete with New Hampshire stores. And we have, you know, zero sales tax over there. I'm still competitive with New Hampshire. It's just the way we run our shops um, that gets people coming to our shops. Katana, thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your um, business and appreciate your um, feedback on this bill. Okay. Thank Are there you. any more questions? No, there, there aren't. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.
Patrick. Yeah. Want me to sit over there? Yeah. Okay. And if you could, inter if you could introduce yourself to the record for the sure. record, and you're on tape, I'm, and clearly all sorts of people are paying attention to you too. All right. Uh, thanks, my name is Patrick Burke. I'm principal at South Burlington High School. I've been in that position for a long time. I've been at the school for 21 years. Do you want me to tell you why I'm in favor of this? Yes. Sure. Um, or if you're not, why not? I, I, am, I am in fact in favor of this, and, and it, it happened rather um, by accident in that um, this, I had heard from some of my principal colleagues that um, that vaping was becoming somewhat of a problem, and um, and not just from like a uh, from like a student management standpoint. It's not like you know the old days, like you go in the bathrooms and they smelled like cigarettes. Like we really, that's gone now. Like they, the bathrooms, you know, don't smell like cigarettes ever in high schools. And I think that's um, you know certainly like when I was in high school in the '80s, that was an issue almost ever. <laughs> but so so what's happening now? What's kind of fascinating is that. Um, uh, it's actually, not, and so we, you know, we really wanted kids to not smoke in, cigarettes inside the school because it was like a nuisance. And schools in the in the, you know, 60s and 70s had like smoking sections and things like that, you know, which is kind of an odd way. But it was like that was how the schools had to deal with the fact that it was becoming this like nuisance in this like management process. So the the ironic thing about about uh, vape products is like they don't create that like same environmental oppression that I think tobacco smoke did. And so, um, and so uh, I had, you know, the, the issue actually with us in terms of um, vaping is that the kids are nicotine addicted, like really nicotine addicted. And I will tell you that in like September, um, it was really hard for us in September because you have a bunch of, you know, 14 to 19 year olds uh, many of whom are, uh, not many, but, but a, a sizable number of whom are coming off a summer where there's fairly like unbridled access to nicotine products and vaping. And now we're saying like, hey, pay attention um, in your history class. And they're saying, I gotta go to the bathroom. I have to go to the bathroom. I have to leave every class. And when I leave classes, I'm, I'm really dealing with an actual addiction. And so we experienced uh, what I would describe as an explosion of that this fall. And I had heard from some of my principal colleagues that they experienced a similar, um, a similar increase in uh, addicted youth. And this spans the entire population. And we had to go all the way back to, you know, our like co-curricular policies and like talk to our student athletes. And, and, um, and it's really difficult because, um, because you know, as, as at least one caller mentioned earlier, you know, there are, um, there are like actually legitimate healthy uses of, for people who are go, trying to go through like smoking cessation or whatever. So you can, you can go online and if you're looking to find somebody to tell you that it's not bad for you, you can find it, you know what I mean? And so, um, uh, and so, so I was frustrated, right? So. Um, I finally went to our school resource officer and I was like, I would like a list of all of the convenience stores that are selling these vape products to these kids because they all have them. You know, like they, they seem to have no problem accessing the products. And you know, I was gonna be like that like good consumer and say like, I'm never going to fill in the blank mobile anymore because they have sold, you know, they've been busted selling vape products to kids. And the school resource officer said, they're not, the, the, none of the convenience stores are getting um, in trouble or cited or whatever, at least none of the ones in South Burlington for selling vape products to underage students. So then I'm like, where are they getting them? And um, it, you know, it can't be that you know, the 18 year olds are all out there buying them and giving them to the freshmen. You know, it's just not, it just doesn't go like that. I'm not saying that never happens, but it doesn't really um, play out like that in school. It didn't with cigarettes, it doesn't with alcohol. You know, so anyway, um, and so he and I looked in there and, and we found out that they get them online. And it's really easy, like super easy. In fact, you could do it yourself. If you just Google big products online, you will get a, you will get to a website and there will be a pop-up that says, please certify that you're a legal smoking age in the state you reside. You can check yes, and then you'll enter the site and you can order whatever you want. 
including like super highly addictive. And I don't want to pretend to know more about the actual technology of vaping than I do because I'm not an expert. But um, but I am told that the um, that the addiction uh, window, especially for young people with developing brains, is really short, and that kids are becoming um, uh, addicted to to nicotine at a at a really uh, alarmingly quick rate. And so so when I found that you know these young people were buying them online. Um, and I kind of remember this one freshman who's, you know, you know how when the freshmen come over to the high school, like you don't know this, but every year when the freshmen come over to the high school, I feel like they look younger. You know what I mean? Like some of that is my gray hair. But, you know, um, there was this one freshman and, you know, I mean, if you had told me that, that he was in grade five, I would have believed you no problem. And, and he's got vape products. And I'm like, how does that guy get vape products? And then that's when we found out that he can collect money from his friends go down to Hannaford, buy a, um, uh, a one-time like Visa gift card, and then um, goes online and orders the vape products and they get shipped to his house and he gets the mail every day before his mom and or dad get home. And, and he's got them and then he was kind of like the, the guy who was, who was supplying them to other um, kids, you know, because he just had it, had it figured out. So, um, so I'm encouraging him to join DECA and the Entrepreneur Club. <laughs> but, 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 you know, uh, I'd like for um, it to, you know, to be under a better circumstance. So anyway, um, when I discovered after the school resource officer from South Burlington Police told me that this was how the kids were getting them, I thought, well, they can't buy a six-pack online, to my knowledge. They can't buy uh, a carton of camel lights online, so they, they shouldn't be able to do this, and and here we are. That's heartening, actually, to hear the retailer, because I do think the retailers are responsible about this. I do think every time I'm in line and somebody's buying tobacco or vape products in front of me in line, they are checking IDs, so, um, you know, I feel like putting the bulk or or 100% of the sales of these products in the hands of, of um, those business folks and it, you know what if there's a bounce to brick and mortar business in Vermont that's great I you know I don't want to necessarily I don't know where you could live in Vermont and not be relatively close to a convenience store where you can buy vape products you know I don't um, it seems to me like you know if there's a gas station there there's a place where you can where you can buy them and um, so anyway, you know, that's, that's my motivation, and I'd like all my kids to graduate from high school without any addictions, and, you know, this is, this is uh, I, think, I think, could be a way, a way forward that would be helpful. Um, Jessica, I had a question, and then Carl. Um, I was curious. Speak up, please. I was curious because you um, did talk about that then it went to the home and the kid was getting it before his parents. Do, have you tried reaching out to parents at all about letting them know that this is a pra you know a practice because I'm one of those parents who has a senior in high school just last year and I didn't know about it till I came here to this community. Yeah. So I was curious if now there's that you guys are starting to reach out. Yeah definitely. I mean especially you know when we're dealing with students who are who are like in violation of our vape policy, obviously that's a conversation yeah, with true. parents. And then more globally I have a um, a prevention coordinator and he communicates broadly with parents and just kind of say like this is it, about everything re related to prevention um, so yes I mean I I do think that um, yeah there there's there's kind of always right this little gap of time where like kids kind of know what's going on and we don't and then we find out that we tell your brother we kind of network around it and do what we can to support kids to make sure that you know that to the extent that we can control it, they're making healthy choices. Well, at least to get the mail before they do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that's like age old. You know, like you might want to get home before the report card. You know, yeah. like, there's like, you know, there's all sorts of like, you know, motivation to get the mail first, I guess. But, um, but yeah, you know, so it's it's been a, uh, and it feels to me like I don't know enough about how to regulate all this stuff. But it seems to me like in reading the the bill as it's currently written, it feels like we can. Um, Carl, then Dan. So how did you get all these kids came back off summer break that were highly, uh, what we call them? Addicted. Yeah. Okay. How did you get them back under control? You know, like, uh, if 
that they were probably trying to make during class. Or, yeah. Because we're hearing stories that they they reach in their desk or in their bag and they take a take a drag on the yeah. fake product or something. Is that true? Do you run into this? Or I mean, I. I I don't want to make it sound like it's it's that bad um, in terms of um, I'm certain that what you just described happens, um, but uh, and I think that what you know just like with any uh, addiction, I think that you know there were some barriers that were put up at school because like we were expecting kids to be in class and you know that that probably tapered their use, but when you're around um, a group of people who are addicted to something who are like coming off of that addiction they, they're cranky and so that was kind of the other element to this was like what is the problem you know why are people so cranky and so um, you know we had an increase in other kinds of, um, of uh, student management issues that that were new to us you know what I mean and and you know I don't want to overstate it because you know it, correlation doesn't equal causation but you know when I've Got more kids out of class all the time, and they're the bathrooms. Like we actually have to patrol the bathrooms. I haven't patrolled the bathrooms in 20 years, you know. And it's like, what's going on? And so, um, and really, we've had like we never have fights at school. Really, mm -hmm. we had a fight this year, and the, it was over like a vape debt, you know. Mm -hmm. And and um, it was like a real fight too, you know. Like we had to separate. It wasn't just like you know a scuffle in a basketball game or something. People pushing and shoving. So. Um, yeah, it really just made me think I just don't see any, you know, value to this. I mean, I guess that people can argue about the, the age or the tax or all that, that's all fine, but, but providing what seems like unbridled access to underage uh, young people in Vermont is definitely a mistake. Thank you. Um, do you have a percentage, like, how many kids are using these products? I mean, I know it's probably hard to get an exact number, but, I mean, is it? Two percent or five percent, or I think it's higher than that. I, we just took our youth risk behavior survey um, right before break. We're on break right now. I think we took it last Tuesday, so we will get that data as part of our youth risk behavior survey. I think and it said twelve percent last year. I think we got testimony. If it was twelve percent last year, I'd be willing to bet it's higher this year. And how many students in your school? Nine hundred fifty. So I'd be, yeah, I'd be willing to bet for sure it's higher than, than 12%. Although, you know, there's I also have, you know, half my senior class are 18, so like they would be like legal users of these products, and so um, they're included in that 12%. I, I would think so. You know, I, I don't I don't want the kids to use them whether they're legal or not, but I think my primary concern, especially with what we know about developing brains, you know, the younger you are, the, it's, it's, the, the shorter that, that addiction cycle can be. You know, it might take an adult, you know, a few months of smoking tobacco or vaping to become a full-on addict, whereas it might take a young person as short as two weeks. And, uh, and you know, it's pretty innocuous, because like, you know, like I said, you know, I haven't had a student athlete, you know, busted for smoking in like 15 years, like smoking actual cigarettes. But now like, we're, you know, we're all like dealing with. And when you sit with these kids, sometimes like last year more than this year, like this year they're starting to get the message, but sometimes last year you'd sit with them and they'd be like, wait, that's against the rules? And I'd be like, it's against the law, you know, like you're 16. Um, but there is, there was at least a little bit more of a, uh, of a mystique that this was like really hard. I think that that's been successfully tackled. I don't think that I don't think that students who are being genuine would really try to make the case that it was a healthy activity to be involved in. Okay. Are there other questions? Oh, sorry, John. How are you doing? Thanks Great. for coming in. Thanks, Tom. Um, you you keep bringing up student athletes. Uh, my, this is all my own experience, because I've got grandkids that are student athletes. Um, if you talk to them, they will tell you that not only is the vaping product itself being used, 
but it's being used for other means as well. I, yeah, I'm sure that's true. And I think you're right when you say it's more than what the survey said last year. And that would be taking into consideration um, the exaggeration that you may be getting too mm -hmm. when you talk to them. So it, it's a problem. I think this is going to go uh, a long ways to helping solve part of that problem. It's not going to solve it altogether, but Fact. it'll help. Yeah. In a big way, I think. And we'll know too, and I'd be happy to come back to the, ex you know, it's all anecdotal anyway, but you know, we'll know next fall. I mean, if it becomes harder for kids to get this summer, I promise you, you know, that, that, you know we will have fewer addicted kids in the, in come September. And I'm here today, my testimony will be very brief. You heard a lot oh. from the, oh, yeah. She, uh, she has a document. <laughs> yes. Oh, no. hold on. <coughs> the, oh, the, um, we're, we're, I guess we're just putting up the ones that you sent. Um, the, oh, yes, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. There you are. <laughs> Thank Thanks. you, Esther. <laughs> um, so you heard a lot from the Commissioner of Health in January about his concerns around e-cigarette use and the emergence of e-cigarette use, particularly among youth, and the health implications that that has for Vermonters. So I'm not going to rehash all of that, and I cannot say it as eloquently as he can. We did provide this um, one pager for um, the public, and it is on our website at healthvermont.gov, and it's just an overview, very quick snapshot of our highest concern around electronic cigarette use and what can be done um, about that. And uh, raising the age of tobacco um, is one option that the CDC and the Surgeon General talk about. Um, and then also counteracting tobacco industry marketing efforts is another one that you know about. A huge piece of tobacco control, and in this case electronic cigarette control, is around access and youth access and initiation. So if we can prevent youth from initiating, then we can prevent further use down the line. Access is one of the main um, ways that we control that. And the fact that youth can go online and um, purchase cigarettes by clicking a box means that they do, in many cases, have fairly free access to electronic cigarettes, even though we control that through our stores and our local retailers, and that they do a very good job checking for age in stores in Vermont. <clears throat> so the health department supports age 26, um, and we hope that the committee does consider it as an important piece of electronic cigarette um, prevention, especially for youth. Thank you, Sheila. Sheila, um, I'm just wondering, one of our witnesses uh, made a particular point to distinguish between e-cigarettes and vaping. Yeah. Um, and so I noticed all the literature you have out there is just e-cigarettes. And um, is there, a, I mean, what's the health department consider in so, terms of distinctions? Yeah, so great question. So um, what the correct term that I should be using is electronic nicotine delivery systems, or ENDS as we call them. And so that encompasses all of, all of them, and we don't distinguish right now. Um, between electronic cigarettes and, and vaping. That is, in, for health implications right now, the research we're using that's in all of those things. I just was thinking yeah. that things like this, while it's great and it's catchy and stuff, and um, somebody could look at this and yeah. say, oh, well, that doesn't mean vaping. Vaping, <laughs> right. I'll ask our communications folks. I, I, well, I'm just making the point that I think it was one of the people on the phone that... <coughs> Lots of questions, uh, Mary Beth and Carl and, and Jessica. 
Uh, you made the point earlier about retail stores and convenience stores being pretty good <laughs> about checking IDs. Yep. Do you have any data at all that yep. shows what's happening in the Vermont landscape? Absolutely. I don't um, personally, but the Department of uh, uh, liquor and Lottery now, I just changed the name, Department of Liquor and Lottery, they do. Mm -hmm. They run the enforcement program and they actually have a very cool online um, system where you can actually go in and search an area or a store mm -hmm. and see their enforcement actions um, and their, their checks. So they send in buyers, um, young buyers, to see, see whether or not they can, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can get that link to Julie. Again, that's not the health department, but it's DLL and they have a really great interactive way to see that information. Great, and you all at the health department feel good about what you're seeing as far as that data? Yeah, they're great partners, yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, um, somebody that was on the phone was talking about e-cigarettes versus the other, what's the other product? Vaping. Yeah, vaping, yeah, vaping but special brand name. Jewel. 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 Jewel, right. That the Jewel was so much higher in nicotine mm -hmm. content. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that. I thought they were all pretty much the same in terms of he's making a special point that the jewel is considerably higher. Are, are you aware of that? Or yeah, so we are particularly concerned about jewel because it is such a huge proportion of the market mm -hmm. and that it can have very high nicotine content. One of the big pieces about ends, I'll call them ends, um, is that there's not any real regulation around what what percent content you can have of nicotine. And so because there's lack of regulation and transparency, a user might not know when they pick up a device, any given device, and you are correct that Juul does have a very high uh, percentage and that they are such a huge portion of the market that that does make them more concerning in that way. Um, do you have a chance to see if the rule around um, no internet sales for cigarettes is working? Like, people still able because I think one of us tried it and, it, and we were able to um, Logan, I was it Logan. yeah no I thought it was Dan, Dan oh yeah. Was, yeah oh you did and I'm yeah. just curious because if we pass this it would be nice to know that it really works <laughs> so that's a great question that would be a really good question for our partners at the Attorney General's office they're the ones who do the enforcement actions there and I can't speak to the specifics on what their success rate I, I don't know the data on that but um, it just seems like a hard thing to enforce. I mean, it's so easy to just go on your computer. How do you locate that someone did that, especially if it's not a store, it's just a person? It's an interesting thought. Did you ever find out anything, Dan? Yeah, well, I emailed the company and said, would you ship to Vermont? And they were like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to use Bitcoin. Oh, you can't um, pay for it without Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, Cigarettes. Oh, cigarettes. Well, regular tobacco cigarettes. So they don't Online. have a trace. See, exactly. that's what we're doing. We're essentially yeah. copying that. That's because that. the, the, laws, the laws probably have not been updated to its really current currency. currency right? So the loophole. Yeah. Topper, you had a question? Yes. When the risk survey was done, how was this question presented? I can get you the exact wording. I don't know it off the top of my head. Well, maybe you know this. Did it use the term vaping products or e-cigarettes? You don't know that, okay. Well, we wait. I'll you can get it for me. You, you can. I'll get it. Yeah. I don't know. That's a great question. Are there other questions for Shayla? Shayla, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you for thank having you. me. Yeah, appreciate it. And um, <coughs> talking about the AG's office, Chris Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christopher Curtis. I'm the Chief of the Public Protection Division at the Office of the Attorney General. Um, as such, uh, our, our division looks over the Consumer Protection Unit, Antitrust Unit, uh, Civil Rights, and our Consumer Assistance Program housed at the University of Vermont in Burlington where we take complaints from consumers and try to resolve those as best we can. Uh, I'm here today to testify in support of H26, the bill before you. Um, I can be relatively brief. I know this is an issue that's uh, been of great concern to Commissioner Levine. I've, I've been at several 
uh, public events where I've heard him speak passionately and eloquently about the uh, challenges associated with youth use of uh, vaping products, electronic cigarettes. And uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, the Attorney General shares that concern about youth use and the potential risk of youth addiction to nicotine at early ages where the brain is still developing um, that could lead to lifelong addictions. So uh, that's the public health consequence. But in part, I'm also here just to recognize that really the bill that's before you is a parity bill. From a legal perspective, I think what the bill is instructing is that, um, you know, frankly, it's not a straight up ban on the product so much as a regulatory restriction to ensure that the product is going to retailers, to licensed wholesale, wholesale dealers. <coughs> so that's the existing state of affairs for tobacco products. Um, so from the perspective of thinking about legal parity among nicotine products, there's a nice symmetry there. Um, and, it, and it starts to create a regulatory structure around products that are similar in nature, although different, but similar in nature vis-a-vis -vis the nicotine content associated with the product. So that's in some ways something of an elegant solution to thinking about how sales and individuals are accessing products in an environment where there might be an addiction risk, and in particular where there might be some youth access. So from that standpoint, I think it's fairly, I mean, the language is not voluminous. It's a fairly straightforward uh, amendment to the existing statutes. Um, but I think there is a growing consensus that this is an area where regulation is required. Um, it's an area where people are really concerned. I can tell you personally that our office, I have personally taken calls from concerned parents who are at their wits end and literally begging begging for somebody to do something about their kids who've been hooked on this product. Um, and these are ch children who are teens who are not of legal age to, to buy. <clears throat> so the existing structure does not appear to be meeting those concerns. Uh, and I think these are relatively new products. I mean, e-cigarettes have been around for a while, but I think um, there are newer models or new, newer versions of e-cigarette type products or vaping products that are coming to market. And as they learn to create um, you know, more streamlined products, more attractive products, uh, products that consumers want, uh, I, I think that um, this is an area that the legislature is well within its rights to be looking at. So, I don't want to take up too much of your, your time today. I know it's pretty straightforward. Mary Beth, and then Chopper, and then Dan. Oh, and then Carl. So one of our previous um, uh, guests who came to testify, not today, but another day, talked about the possibility of putting into place a way that um, parents or adults of legal age would have to sign for packages when they were delivered as, as that being a solution. I'm curious, um, you know, one of the questions that we had was, is that even enforceable among delivery companies? Um, curious what your reaction to that would be. It's a great question. I, I can't rule it out out of hand. I guess because it's a new construct, I'm not quite sure. I, I don't really know how to respond to it because I'm not sure. I, I think I have the same questions that you do, which is, you know, how, what does that look like in practice, right? right? How's it actually going to work? Um, what, what are the standards that are set out? Uh, I don't know the answer to those questions. Um, I, I do think that um, that sounds like there's some acknowledgement that there needs to be some tighter control. I guess one of the benefits of what's before you in the bill is that it's consistent with what's already in place, um, at least for traditional tobacco products. So there's an awareness there. I will say uh, I heard the question that was raised earlier about you know how enforceable is the existing statute with respect to the tobacco and the sales. Um, and I will say that uh, as may not surprise you, the way that complaints come to our office as a law enforcement agency are typically through complaints. If you have a satisfied consumer who is buying a program, even if it's skirting Vermont law, and the company's not disclosing, and the consumer's not disclosing, it's very rare that we're going to get a complaint out of that. Um, and so it's hard to manage or to know precisely what the contours are. Um, 
of course, if the represent wants to share information or make a complaint, um, we're always happy to receive those. One of the things that we do at the Attorney General's office is we offer those constituent services to you and to your constituents. So um, if you have a particular question or problem and you want to bring it to our attention, um, we, we, it's part of what we do. It's part of why we're here. Um, but again, it's, it's a challenge. But I think as far as a regulatory construct, Look, the, the truth is, as with any law that's passed, the good actors and good corporate actors out there who are responsible will look to the laws, they have counsel, they have representation, uh, and they do their very best to abide by the laws of the state. Um, there are actors sometimes who do not abide by the laws of the state. Um, sometimes that's unintentional. Sometimes it's because they're engaged in practices that we would not condone. So. That's always a challenge. Um, but I think that when the state speaks per a public policy that this is what's required under state law, most of those good corporate actors are going to go out of their way to comply. Um, so there's a reduction there in terms of what you're, the goal that you're trying to achieve. Um, Any issues with constraint of trade or uh, constraint of inter uh, interstate commerce? relative to, let's say, a law like this and being challenged by, let's say, uh, somebody who wants to sell on, online. Have you had problems like that or actions brought against uh, the state or your, your department because of some of the other constraints we place, like on cigarettes or alcohol and sales online? Well, again, I think this is an area where the legislature can take some comfort in that what you're striving to do is create parity with the law that's been on the books for some time now. Um, so the state has some experience with that. And um, so really all you're doing is adding a new classification or category for a similar type of product, a nicotine product. Again, <coughs> diff different in some ways, but, and you're not restricting the sale, you're not banning the sale. What you're saying is it has to go through licensed wholesale dealers mm -hmm. or it has to go through retailers. So, um, I wouldn't anticipate that if the existing statute hasn't been challenged or struck down. Thank you. Jessica, I was, I was upset. What? Catherine? Um, <clears throat> do you think that it would be appropriate to uh, add the term vaping products to this bill? <clears throat> um, I'd have to think about that. Um, Representative Pond. So, as you've already heard in committee, there can be confusion about what a vaping product is, and I'm sensitive to um, the department's previous testimony that perhaps there are more accurate descriptors. Um, so, I think that's certainly fodder for your committee discussion and perhaps for ledge council and for the department to have some additional discussion. I would just want to make really sure that uh, if, you, if you're talking about adding vaping products, to that, that you're not either capturing something that you don't intend to capture, or that if you substitute vaping products for something else, as currently defined, that you're not then releasing certain items that you're trying to capture. So you're quite right to focus on the definitions, because oftentimes the whole the whole bill hangs on the definition. So I think that's a place where you, your committee could have some, some additional discussion. We're happy to work with you on that and work with your legislative council. I, I certainly wouldn't rule it out, but I just would want to make absolutely crystal clear that the committee is comfortable with what that means and what it signifies and what it triggers. Uh, just back to the um, shipping from, uh, you know, whether we pass this bill um, or shipping just regular cigarettes, is that, is it enforceable if it's coming from another state? Do you have the resources to go to who knows where to enforce this or is it yeah, I mean, if you think about it, it's a, uh, if you think about all the sticks of tobacco that are sold in the state of Vermont, uh, huge, huge number. Um, and we do make sure that even in the retail construct, um, our friends at DLL, you know, they, they do go in and they audit stores to make sure that they're selling only to, uh, you know, legal adults. Uh, and so that's a one at a time, right? And it's not always a perfect construct. Sure. I think the same is true through the internet. What you're articulating with the law is this is the policy of the state of Vermont. As I said earlier, I think most of the good corporate actors out there, and there are many, will certainly abide by that. 
There are some who may not, either intentionally or unintentionally. And then the question is, how does it get reported? Um, and then, you know, the same as with any investigation our office undertakes, you follow the facts where they lead. So it's not a question of enforceable or not enforceable. I think that's what you're setting out as the policy for the state of Vermont. If there's an infraction or a violation, it's up to law enforcement then to um, pursue the facts where they lead. Um, are, are we currently getting a huge number of complaints in this area vis-a-vis -vis traditional tobacco? No. You know, so it would really, you know, it, it, it may be an unusual circumstance that brings something to our attention. Or it may be that um, either somebody at DLL or parents or other consumers suddenly identify that there's you know, a particular actor where there's a lot of product coming in through a certain mechanism, and that might alert law enforcement officials. Thank you. Um, Chris, you just said we're not getting a lot of complaints. Um, it seems to me that this is this is highly public. Oh, yes. So why do you have to have a complaint? Well, so <laughs> that's a great question. What I mean is individual consumer complaints about um, uh, a sale that somebody was attempting to avail themselves of online because they want to use the product. Um, we are getting a, a lot of concern and complaints from parents who are very concerned about their teenage teenage use. Um, and anecdotally, I can share with you that, I mean, really serious, uh, people who are very upset, very concerned about this. Um, although it's interesting that I think that uh, parents aren't always clear where exactly where or how their children are getting the product. Whether that's through a retail environment, whether it's peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, whether it's online, they're not always sure. And um, there's a, there was a, one person in particular I can remember said, you know, we're silently dealing with this crisis in our home. So they were reaching out to say where where's the rest of the state on this? And I think they, they're wanting to know what lawmakers think, what the administration thinks, what the Attorney General's office thinks about this issue. So this is one step, one measure that you can take um, and be supporting that, in that endeavor. Uh, Tapo, do you have one more question? This is a personal opinion. Consumer protection, uh, in the broad sense of that, we know Everybody in this room knows that this product is hurting youngsters and, prob and probably adults. That seems to me that under the consumer protection work of the Attorney General's office, that you would be doing something about it. So, Chris, if you have not gotten the message, perhaps uh, there are members of this committee who would suggest you look into it or perhaps do the same kind of thing that a member of the committee did mm -hmm. in terms of um, accessing um, tobacco over Certainly, I appreciate the sentiment. You know, of course, that we never speak about uh, our internal work, uh, whether or not we're engaged in particular activities, so, um, but I, I take your meaning and appreciate the sentiment. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your taking the time. Thank you. And we're going to wrap up with um, Legislative Council and Jim. Wrap up for today. Hey. Jennifer Carby, Legislative Council. Um, so I just wanted to respond to some of the things that have come up and I've been trying to do some research here off to the side, um, which means I may not have complete answers to everything, but if there are certain things you want to pursue, we should look into them. Um, one of them is about the delivery, and there seems to be um, an, a specific issue of preemption in this area where uh, the federal government has a fair amount of um, regulation in place for common carriers, which are the delivery services, and the states are preempted from um, imposing additional restrictions. So there seems to have been some litigation on that specific point in the context of um, cigarettes. So I want to look more into that if that was something you were looking to do. So, so delivery meaning um, meaning delivery of yes or right. um, or, or the post or office, yes. but not in terms of I mean delivery. Yes, delivery shipping. 
shipping the, you know, um, shipping through the mails or or through the private system like UPS and FedEx. Um, so, and there does seem to be some requirements, as there are some requirements already in place for age verification um, at the federal level. Um, whether those are actually happening, I don't know. So, if there, I guess this would be something for us to get clearer on if there are these federal things around delivery. We have in our statute of a um, prohibition of sale of tobacco, of combustible. In our existing law. In our existing law. Yes. And so this builds on something that is in our existing law. Yes. So um, how that fits. Or yes. So let me look some at that. Um, I'm also still working on sort of figuring out the extent to which in the federal, in the FDA's deeming rule where they deemed all um, electronic you know, e-cigarette and I'll talk about that definition in a minute too um, and other tobacco products to be within the definition of tobacco products um, and so they, they effectively swept most of their regulation of tobacco um, to cover all of these different emerging categories um, it's a little unclear how some pieces of that may have extended to certain regulation of electronic cigarettes um, on the question of, like, of e-cigarettes or vaping or whatever you want to call them, we actually use the term in statute tobacco substitutes, and that has its own definition that I will pull up for you. Um, so I don't think it's, I don't think it's, a, oh. I don't think it matters, frankly, whether you say e-cigarette or vaping, as long as your statute has a definition that captures what you want it to capture. Oh, there it is. Wait. It's a good machine. All right. It's getting old. So the last definition here is tobacco substitute. Means products including electronic cigarettes or other electronic or battery powered devices that contain and are designed to deliver nicotine or other substances into the body through the inhalation of vapor and that have not been approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for tobacco cessation or other medical purposes. And then specifically says products that have been approved by the U.S. FDA for tobacco cessation or other medical purposes shall not be considered tobacco substitutes. So if a vaping uh, instrument is approved by FDA for tobacco for cessation, mm -hmm then it would not fit into your definition. So far that has not happened. You may need to revisit your definition if that happens and, and decide if there are different ways you want to treat things. So that has not happened? That has, to my knowledge, I'll look to the people in this area, but the FDA has not approved any uh, e-cigarette vaping device as a tobacco cessation device. The um, man on the telephone, one of the witnesses mentioned something about some American metal, medical, but I, I haven't heard of anything. So like that, that sounded like it was a, uh, a uh, like a medical study in the um, New England Journal of Medicine. I'm right. not familiar with the right. study itself, but that sounded like what he was talking right. about. So it wasn't from the federal government, it was from a, from you know, a, 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 yeah. a scientific okay. journal. Um, and I, you can probably find so that if people want to see it. I so I guess mine's not a question necessarily, more of a comment about it seems like the definition that we're looking at here I mean we say tobacco substitutes but then we go on to also say liquid containing nicotine so it doesn't um, so I guess I would be um, talking about in the bill in the bill yeah um, right I think the definition of tobacco substitute is talking about the device and not necessarily what goes into it that's why I added the language about right. the liquids that go right. with it. Um, so, I mean, we don't know what the FDA is going to do at some point in time if there continues to be research on these things and if they continue, if they have some credibility. I don't think that would change our opinion about wanting to, um, you know, 
not have them sold on the internet to youth in particular. But um, so I'm just I'm just wondering if there's um, does the the phrase that you have after that with that um, if the let's just say FDA approved that at some future time with the phrase after that. Um, be sufficient Which phrase? that the liquids containing nicotine are otherwise intended for use or otherwise intended for use with the tobacco. So that links it back to the tobacco. Right, so that would too. still be the liquid intended for use with it. Yeah. I think it's hard to, I mean, at this point, I, I'm not aware of any indication that the FDA is likely to approve these as a tobacco cessation device. They seem to be headed more in the other direction with additional regulation. Yeah, okay, on so these. Not, don't worry about um, it. I think at the time that, that we were working on the definition in this committee, I think there was concern about somebody who might be using, um, there was, there's some other thing where you don't heat up the liquid, but you sort of breathe in a vapor out of a tube, may have menthol in it or something. I can let Rebecca tell you more about it if you want, but people were concerned that is FDA approved, and people were concerned that, that this definition of tobacco substitute might inadvertently pull in things that that were medically recognized or recognized by the FDA as tobacco cessation devices. <clears throat> Carl. Yeah, I was just wondering, it just sort of dawned on me that uh, at least over the course of my life, kept on hearing one of the toughest laws on the books is mail fraud, okay? When the, the government, you know, gets involved in something to do with the mail, it seems that they, uh, I was just curious, who would be the responsible party where somebody underage has requested a product of a manufacturer and then it comes through the mail to the individual? Um, who, who would be the party that could be charged with fraud? Um, could they? Now, maybe the Attorney General's office. Yes, it's probably better for the Attorney General's office. I think there may be some issues with people under 18 and their, um, <coughs> their legal capacity there. but. Um, Chris has an answer on that. Before. Sure, certainly. Uh, again, for the record, Chris Curtis from the Attorney General's Office. So, um, there are consequences for youth who purchase uh, yeah. tobacco or alcohol illegally, of course. Um, most of those result in diversion or uh, coursework or volunteer service, things like those things, things of that nature. Um, mail fraud is a little bit different in the sense that it's not the unfair or deceptive act isn't necessarily the person who's signed up actually wants the product and the product is actually delivered, what you're talking about is a violation of the statute mm -hmm. that's in force and effect. So the enforcement would come, I mean, I suppose if there were a question about, um, you know, on a massive scale, a massive breach of, of our laws, could somebody make the case that that was a fraudulent act? I'm not altogether sure. There are postal inspectors who have some enforcement authority in this area as well. Um, and of course, the attorneys general do, and then on a national scope, the, the FTC does as well. So, um, when it comes to consumer protection, there are multiple levels of potential enforcement capacity. At the local level, if it was an individual who was getting into trouble by violating the, the youth statutes, it would be you know local police or a local prosecutor who took that up. Um, Right, and there are provisions in for you know there's a there's a greater penalty financial penalty I think it's fifty dollars instead of twenty five dollars if somebody misrepresents their age in order to mm -hmm. purchase any of these products. Um, but I think that thank you that's not responsive to your specific question about the mail mail fraud. But mail fraud generally is is a federal offense, not a state. <coughs> um, I do want to answer. You had also asked me before, and you asked Chris um, today about commerce clause. Uh, and whether this kind of regulation would be a violation of the Commerce Clause. There does seem to be case law actually specifically on that question, and in that case, and I would find it likely in other cases as well, the, um, the state's police power, its ability to enact laws to protect its residents and to kind of weigh the, the, um, any incidental impact on interstate commerce against protecting the health and safety of its residents tends to come out in favor of the state regulation. So I, I don't think we have, yeah, it doesn't strike me as a Commerce Clause issue. Other questions for Jen? So, um, committee, we have this um, on our schedule again Thursday afternoon when we get off the floor. Um, 
There has been, and actually Mary Beth, you've asked a question again around sort of delivery. So one, if you can yep. try to tease that apart. And um, we had talked previously about um, being curious as to UPS ships wine or something, I don't know, um, as to having someone from UPS come in and talk about where they deliver it or whatever. Um, are there other people? What? You should just order some of that. <laughs> Is she worried that she might be? Oh, oh. oh no, there, there are. Okay, um, are, um, what other sort of right, right now? What other issues are out there? Who are there other um, witnesses that we would like to hear from? I'm just wondering, like, if, I think UPS is a great idea. I'm, I'm curious if the other, I mean, I don't want to, I don't think we should bring in someone from all the different, but I'm curious if they would follow all the same similar, um, you know, protocols. And but to the extent they're required to, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, if okay. Okay. so we'll so have one. Right. So, we'll so some that. of that, okay. yeah. Okay. Good. So, can I, I have a question? I'm kind of curious, say we pass this law, it goes into effect July 1st. Um, I'm, I don't know that it does, but no, no, I'm just pulling up the bed. <laughs> um, how does the word get out there? So how do we make sure that Jules knows you can't send here anymore, or your or our attorney general is going to know it? <laughs> Maybe. Um, yeah, implementation. <laughs> yeah. Like implementation. How does that? It's a good question. I don't think I can answer that for you. Okay, so there's no consistent way so, that so, so, so I mean, I think a lot of the people around the room often get the word out to their clients and others. That's so how I, I might say for the people who are um, listening, who are sitting around the room following this, I'm not sure everyone's followed, some on the yes, it's a good idea, others of which no, it's not so good an idea. Mm -hmm. um, What has happened and how have we gotten the word out when we've done other things related to, um, <coughs> um, in particular, tobacco? Because we seem to, when, when I look down at all the times that this law has changed, this one. Uh, or yes. there's, there's mm -hmm. a few things. I mean, it's like, you know, 92, 99, 2007, 2011, 13, 13, 18. Um, how, how has the word gotten out and how do we do things? Mm -hmm. So perhaps, um, so other, other things, top or other? I, I would just like, go ahead. Go, no, yeah, go ahead. I would just like to make sure that the definition that we have <clears throat> now concerning uh, electronic cigarettes or, or devices, that the definitions that we have on the book cover the vaping products. It, it is my understanding that they do, but I think I, I am not, by any stretch of the imagination, an expert on vaping products. So I think you may need to hear from others about whether there are products out there that don't fit. Um, so again, I will say to the assembled groups, if you have positions or views or suggestions around what it should or shouldn't look like, Please let us know. We have not. We have heard from the health department that they support this. Um, they've not proposed any amendments. That doesn't mean that we don't make, have to make changes. But um, yes, Carl. I, I'm just thinking back. It seemed like we had some testimony very early on about somebody that was against this bill uh, for the fact that he wanted to expand into uh, internet sales. From his store, it sounded like okay, and I, I don't know whether that's practical or not, quite frankly. But I, he I gave it up. All that. Okay. He said he gave it up. Oh, he gave it up. <clears throat> yeah. He gave up trying to do it, or he. Uh, that's what I thought he said. Uh, you're, you're referring to someone last week from the Retail Grocers Association yeah, who talked it. about that concern. Yeah. So I was just curious if there's somebody we should hear from well, that might have an interest in. 
expanding their sales on the internet, you know. I mean, I think what we, we did hear that from the Grocers Association. Okay. Well, they had a, um, a vape that one of their clients right. are the vaping okay, providers, so. and that there may be, um, I, I'm not, to be perfectly honest, I'm not quite sure how the, the language of this bill would impact a retailer mm -hmm. who wanted to do this. Oh, that's funny. Well, if they're trying to sell them uh, <clears throat> on a retail oh, I see. basis. Well, oh, I see what you mean. To, to have the local Jiffy Mart be the be yeah. able to sell what, it. What this question makes me think of is, is um, well, it couldn't sell like an internet couldn't sell here, mm -hmm. but it doesn't specifically say that the internet couldn't exist here and sell to another state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. but I know that's not what we're dealing with. But I just, right. I'm, this is what triggered in my head. Right? We're not saying there can't be vaping business here. Mm -hmm. We're just, yeah. okay. that, that's another. <clears throat> it was just, you know, you were asking about other people yeah. we'd want to testify. So, so far, I mean, two people we spoke to weren't, weren't involved in the internet business. They were just retailers of this product. I guess I don't understand what you mean by the internet business. You mean someone who. Somebody that figures they want uh, a bigger piece of the pie, so they they actually want to be able to retail the product over okay. the internet themselves. Right. Somebody okay. wants to expand their retail business okay. to also right. include okay. the internet. Which is, I think, why the grocers. Um, yeah. uh, and that's why it came up, I guess, in yeah. that context. So, you know. so, Madam Chair, who would be, is, is the Attorney General's office an opinion from the Attorney General's office, uh, the head of consumer protection, or? How, who would make that, give us some advice on that, uh, uh, um, on well, the definition, whether uh, it covers? Um, I think that um, whether it covers the people who would give us advice would be the people who, who know what the products are. And um, I'm, so I'm looking to those folks um, I, um, to see whether or not it works. Um, Chris Curtis from the Attorney General's office is here, and I'm sure that they can connect with him. And I look forward to um, any proposed amendments on Thursday. Okay. Have Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, folks, a 10 minute break. Um, thank you. We have stopped this and we're now going to move on to appreciate and Patrick. Thank you. Thank you for coming and yeah. adding your voice. Thanks, thanks for taking it on. Yeah. Um, and uh, 10 minutes and then we're going to the budget. Thank you.